please be seated. And I want to, at this point, welcome online viewers who are joining us as we come to the reading and expounding of God's Word. So we're going to continue in Luke's Gospel with Luke chapter 3, and uh, Aileen's going to come and read to us. Thank you. The reading can be found in Luke chapter 3, commencing at verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Traconitus, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him, every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked roads shall become straight, and the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation." John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, The man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. And then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't exhort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, I baptise you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the, his barn. But he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my son, who I love, with you I am well pleased. Amen. Well, Father, we again thank you for your written word to us. May it point us, as it's intended, more and more to Jesus, the living word, that we might draw closer to him for the glory of your name. Amen. You brood of vipers. <laughs> Shall I go on? Is that our style of evangelism these days? No. It's not, is it? Uh, there's many uh, forms of evangelism, of course, many theories about evangelism. Uh, but I think the one that has dominated probably since uh, post Billy Graham has been what's called attractional evangelism. Uh, there's some merit in this. People uh, need to know they're loved by God, of course. Uh, they need to be uh, drawn into fellowship with him. 
But I think a lot of people would admit that attractional evangelism has not actually been very successful. We want to be so nice. We want to be nicer than anything else. We want to be the best show in town, so we go to a lot of trouble to be really nice, to turn on a really good show, to tell people they need to come to our meeting, our evangelistic rally. The kids will get sweets. The parents will get a nice, kind message. And uh, we'll show them love for sure. And so we should. But I think something is often missing. This uh, reading from chapter 3 of Luke's Gospel, I really struggled to find a theme this week because there's three distinct parts to it. Do we talk about the vileness of people? Do we talk about having to give up half of everything you have? Do we simply focus on Jesus' baptism? I'm going to call this uh, sermon The Strange Ways of God because that's the thing that to me unites all three parts. I wonder if you read that introduction in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius and then the mention of Pilate and then people we don't know so well, people like Lysanias, uh, the territory of Abilene. I wonder if you skip over that a bit like a genealogy. You know, what's Luke doing giving us this long-winded introduction to John's ministry? I always used to. But there's something going on there that's really important. Think about it. Who is emperor in Rome? Tiberius Caesar. Who's in charge in what we think of today as Israel? Herod the Tetrarch, Philip, Lysanias. These are important people. They are sitting in important places. They are in Rome or in palaces, flash houses. And then there's some really important religious leaders. There's Annas. And Caiaphas, high priests, presumably spending their time in the temple. They're important, and they're at the center of Israelite religion, the temple. Annas and Caiaphas. Annas was a high priest whose shadow extended a long way. He's no longer high priest now when John's preaching, but he's still called high priest because his family are so dominant. The priesthood is a family affair. Caiaphas is the actual serving one, but Annas is still there and he'll be there throughout the gospel. So you have this, in a, send, in a sense, a descending order of important people of important places from the emperor right down to the local tetrarch, the local governor. And then you have this hierarchy in the priesthood. And then what do you have? But the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. What an anticlimax, isn't it? John, a nobody. John, almost on the lunatic fringe. And we have lots of diets today, don't we? Often for good medical reasons, sometimes by good ethical choice. I won't name them because I want anyone to think I'm knocking at them. I'm not. But even on that scale... John is right out there. He's into what? Locusts and wild honey. He's a nutter. And he's in the wilderness. Why on earth would the word of God go to a man like that? I don't imagine he had a big social circle. And where did he live? He lived... Somewhere in the area of the Jordan. The words used to describe that is the word, are the words used to describe the area that Lot asked for when they divided the, 
the land with Abraham. Lot said, I'll take this area. What did it include? It included the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where John was located, on the edge of the wilderness. Probably also at the very place where the Israelites, when they crossed into the promised land after 40 years wandering in the desert, probably where they crossed over. There may be something symbolic in that too. That's where John was baptizing. Symbolically, surely, of a new exodus. A new coming into God's promises. And people had to go out to him. They'd heard this wonderful message. This guy's a preacher and he's telling us we're vipers. You must come and hear him. Can you imagine that today? Wouldn't that fill the auditorium, the marquee? God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Why did John get such a rapturous reception? Because the people of God, the Israelites, had suffered years of oppression at the hands of people like the Roman emperor, corrupt local governors, pretenders like Herod, Herod the Great, who wasn't a true Jewish king. And Herod Antipas was no better. They were brutal people. They weren't God's anointed at all. And the people had had 400 years of seemingly absence of God. God didn't speak for 400 years. There'd been no prophet since Malachi. Just oppression. There'd been a short time under the Maccabees where they'd had something like independence. But in many ways, the exile had never ended. They were not in charge in their own land. But they had promises. They had their Old Testament scripture, their Hebrew scriptures. They had the words of Isaiah, particularly chapters 40 to 55, promising restoration, that there would be a real return, that they would return to Zion with singing and joy. The expectation was that eventually, one day, God would raise up a new king, a new David, who would free them of this oppression. Why hadn't he done that yet? Because of their sin. They knew that. They also had the closing verse of the Old Testament, as we now know it. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So there was an air of expectancy that someone would come and this oppression would finally cease. And Isaiah had promised that indeed a messenger would come and prepare the way. And he describes it in terms of great tectonic things happening, hills collapsing, valleys being left up, sort of earthquake stuff, isn't it? Not to be taken literally, not geographically, if that's the right word, geologically, I don't know. But a tectonic reshaping of people's hearts. There needed to be a cleansing, a repentance, which means, in the Greek thinking, is a change of mind completely, a reprogramming. In the Hebrew thinking, it's literally a turning around, a change of direction. Something radical needed to happen. And John announces that that time has come. So the reason why people were coming out, streaming out of their towns to the Jordan to meet this idiot in camel here was because they were desperate. 
because they had the hope of the Scriptures. And above all, I think, because God's Spirit was moving again. You know, there have been great revivals through the centuries. There have been people like Whitfield who have preached very similar sort of messages. No candy-coated gospel. And people have literally streamed out of their houses to hear and been convicted. Not everyone, but great numbers. And that's what's happening here. And John is saying, you need to go through this ritual washing, this baptism, as a sign. And it's also because in terms of their thinking at the time, that was a necessary preparation for the day of the Lord. And what's the response? The response from the crowds, from the tax collectors, from the soldiers, presumably Herod's henchmen, Jewish uh, sort of armed men. They all respond the same. What must we do? Do you remember another time where those same response was given? The day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had been poured on the apostles. And Peter preaches, and at the end, the question is, what must we do? You see, repentance isn't just something that happens in the heart. That's got to happen. That's the main part. But it must be lived out. What must we do? And the answer is remarkably simple. Share your food with the hungry. Give your spare tunic, your sec- not really spare, not if you're going to do some washing, but give your second tunic to the person who doesn't have one. If you're a bully, a soldier, stop being a bully. Be kind. And be contented with what you have. So you don't rip other people off, but presumably so also that you can give that extra food that you don't really need to somebody else. It's remarkably simple, isn't it? Repentance or living it out. And yet it's remarkably hard if you think about it. I I almost don't use the word spare these days, but think if you've got anything spare at home that you could give away. There wouldn't be any of us who don't have something. Not something that's trashy and useless, but something significant that actually is spare. This is the call. Repent. Is that an end in itself? Is that just to clean up our lives? No. John says this is simply the preparation so that you can receive the greater one who's coming. And that's so important. This is where the church sometimes has only preached half the gospel. We preach repent, but you repent so that you can be filled with the Spirit. So that you can be baptized by Jesus and come into an empowered relationship with Him. That's what John was preaching about. And so when people say, are you the one? Or even they're thinking it and he knows. He says, no, no, no. Don't stop here. Don't... Worry about me. He talks himself down. In fact, he demeans himself terribly. And he must have been some preacher to get away with that sort of talk and still have people streaming to him, even allowing for the Holy Spirit to be involved. He says, I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals of the one that I'm preparing you for. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal to us. But in the Middle East, feet and sandals are untouchable. Even Hebrew slaves did not have to untie sandals. Because for some reason in the Middle East, in their mindset, these things are disgusting. I think I've told you before that uh, when Kenneth Bailey, the great uh, Middle Eastern scholar, was doing a movie of the prodigal from Luke 15. He could not get an actor to put the sandals on the prodigal's, the returning prodigal's feet 
Because even today, no actor, no Middle Eastern actor would do that. That would just be too demeaning. I can't think of a parallel, except it would be too disgusting to put here for what it might be for us. And yet John is saying, I am not worthy to do that. I'm not worthy that, that you couldn't debase yourself more. So much greater is Jesus. And we're told with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. What is this good news? Jesus coming with his winnowing fork in his hand. God's wrath about to be poured out, says John. How is that good news? Well, there's a couple of things that can be said about this. Firstly, that God's wrath or John's preaching is a warning. It's not a judgment. And there's a big difference. The axe is laid to the root, but it hasn't yet struck. The tree hasn't yet been felled. So this is a gracious warning. It's not the outpouring of God's wrath. It's the warning that if you choose to reject, if you refuse to receive Christ, then there will be trouble. There will be. But the converse to that is if you do repent, if you do say, what shall we do? And you do it. If you are ready to receive Christ, then the message is that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In other words, you will receive all the benefits of being reborn as God's children. There won't be any wrath for you. You have nothing to worry about and plenty to look forward to and rejoice in. So this is what John is wanting people to hear, not condemnation, but the wonderful benefits, the freedom from oppression that they've been longing for is about to come. Jesus is about to do it. He is the one they've been looking forward to. He is the Messiah. Sadly, not everyone will repent. Those big names mentioned. Hear it. Annas, Caiaphas. They all come up again, don't they, in the gospel? Herod is mentioned now. He's heard. He hasn't been there. He hasn't been called a viper. But he's got the message. And he's not happy. And so he tries to shut John down. Richard Dawkins has said that Christianity is a fairy tale for those who are afraid of the dark. John Lennox has responded that atheism is a fairy tale for those who are afraid of the light. I like that. Atheism is a fairy tale for those who are afraid of the light. John opens the scoffer, doesn't he? He says, the light has come, but some have preferred the darkness. They are afraid of the light. Herod was afraid of the light. He didn't want to give up his brother's wife. And so he thought he could just extinguish the light. How wrong he was. And then Luke tells us that when all the people were baptized, and John also had been baptized, sorry, and Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, three things happened. But again, don't run over that little phrase when these things had happened. John has just pointed out that he is not worthy to untie the sandals of Jesus' feet. It's funny how John disappears from the scene. In Luke's gospel alone, there is no mention of John baptizing Jesus. Now, that's because Luke didn't know or didn't agree that he did. But it seems he's wanting to reinforce this. In fact, Jesus and John only meet once in Luke's gospel. 
And it's already happened. When? In utero. The visitation. That's the only time in Luke's gospel that John and Jesus actually come or are, t- ex- or are said to come face to face, as it were. John's now invisible. Jesus is baptized and then he prays. And three things happen. Now, it's interesting because when we baptize people here, after their baptism, we send them off with people and they are prayed for. And sometimes people say to me, isn't that rather a strange thing to do? Why do you need to do that? Well, it's quite biblical, actually. They're beginning a new life. And to be prayed for is uh, meaningful, it's significant, it's important. But this is another category of that Jesus is praying. Let's have the, the slide, please, Helen. And I, I really quite struck by this painting uh, by a, a guy called Daniel, what's his name? Daniel Bunnell. I don't know anything about him. But here is his painting, I believe, of Luke's uh, description. Because there's no John the Baptist pouring water on Jesus as in most pictures of Jesus' baptism. You see there the three things, or two of the three things happening. Jesus is praying and the heavens open. That's the first thing. The heavens in Mark's gospel are torn apart. It's dramatic. And Luke says the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove. He gives more detail than the other gospel writers. Why? Because this is an objective reality. This is a historical fact, like the resurrection. It's not someone's spiritual reflection. The Holy Spirit visibly came down upon Jesus at his baptism, and presumably others saw it. The heavens open, the Holy Spirit comes down, and then God speaks. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Twice previously, we have been told by Luke that God showed favor, or Jesus grew in favor with God and with men and women. But now God tells Jesus, presumably with others hearing that he is his beloved son and he is well pleased with him. This is God affirming that Jesus is indeed far greater than the great prophet John the Baptist. He's way, way more powerful and important and people will need to listen to him. I like this painting for a number of reasons. One is obviously Jesus has the form of the dove too, expression of the closeness of the Trinity perhaps. But if you look carefully, Jesus isn't just shaped like a dove. All you need to do is put a couple of bits of wood behind him and you can see that the baptism is also a crucifixion scene and you see in the water his feet crossed over like they are in paintings of Jesus' crucifixion. In Mark 10, Jesus challenges the disciples who are vying for positions of of status and whatnot, privilege. Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I will be baptized? Jesus links his baptism with his crucifixion. And so does Bonnell. And you'll see one hand Jesus' left hand is turned down. This is a crucified hand. But the right hand is lifted up in victory. Beyond crucifixion, his new life is resurrection. It's all in there. And it's all in Luke's gospel. You see, this is why Luke says that John expounded good news. For those who receive Christ. And the key is humble themselves. 
those who humble themselves, and people like Dawkins, Hitchens, that is their big problem. It is human pride, it's hubris to think there is no God. The psalmist says, doesn't he? The fool says in his heart, there is no God. God's wisdom might seem like foolishness to us, but God's thoughts are so far higher than ours that what he says is true and what anyone who rejects him says is false. Ultimately, John's message is good news, not because it's nice, not because it's a soft, sugar-coated message, but simply because it's true. If you receive Christ, if you open your heart to him, then you won't suffer the fire. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit and know the life and the freedom of being born as God's children. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your gospel is good news to all who receive you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you humbled yourself to make yourself known to us. Lord, help us to humble ourselves so that we are people who are prepared for your return. Lord, help us not just to be humble in heart, but to respond, to ask what do we need to do now to prepare for your return in glory. And Lord, may we be able to be an effective witness to you. And may your spirit move in the hearts of all people so that we might again see revival, that we might see people flocking to hear the gospel. We pray it in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.